Well, good morning to the brave. Thank you for coming. I, uh, sometime today, I guess we're going to get this uh, big snowstorm, but, uh, but you're all the courageous ones, and I'm glad you could come. And you're in for a treat. Uh, you're, you're going to have the privilege of hearing one of the genuine intellectuals in, in the department, uh, Cecil Haney, and we're so grateful. And I just would say, uh, Admiral, thank you. You're a real privilege to have you here. Um, we always start, you know, with public events, a little bit of a safety announcement. Nothing's going to happen, but I would, Bob, there's a space right up here for you. Come up, no, come up here, Bob. Wait, wait. Undersecretaries get that. Come up here. Um, if there's, a, if there's a problem, you're going to follow my direction. Uh, if we have to evacuate, the exits are right over here behind us, and the stairway down to the street is in that corner, and you'll just follow me, but nothing's going to happen. So I'll just, uh, but in case something, just let me know. Um, it's a real privilege to have Admiral Haney here. Uh, you know, he's a native son uh, of, of Washington, D.C., he, uh, and, and he came here to visit Sink Haney. That's his 92-year-old mother who is still living here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I actually think he's probably not going to have a chance to see her because of the way the weather is moving, but uh, she's in good hands, and, uh, and we're very proud to be able to say that he is a native son of Washington, uh, uh, went to school up at Eastern High School. So it's... Uh, it just shows that there are, uh, when real talent, you know, they can rise to the top, and we're so proud to have him back. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Admiral Haney for a couple of years, and I've always I've been impressed in two domains. One is uh, he's, a, he's an intellectual uh, and uh, thinks deeply about these thoughts and has been thinking more deeply about deterrence, deterrence theory than anybody, and I, and a general officer that I know in recent years. So I think we're very lucky for that. Uh, he's also deeply committed to nurturing the next generation. We sponsor a program called PONY, Program on Nuclear Issues, and it's designed to help mentor the rising generation of uh, men and women who want to serve their country in the area of uh, strategic weapons and things of this nature. And Admiral Haney's been deeply committed to their uh, growth. And I just say thank you for that. It's, it's a testament to his leadership in all domains. We're very lucky to have him here. I'm very glad that you could join us. And would you please, with your warm applause, welcome and thank Admiral Cecil Haney. Well, good morning. And uh, thanks, Dr. Henry, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'll be sure to tell mom she was mentioned here. Uh, uh, and she gets disappointed because most of my visits in and out of Washington, D.C., I don't get to see her. But I do talk to her every evening on the telephone, so uh, she helps me with my strategic thinking. <laughs> I'm just ecstatic to be here uh, today, uh, to be here with you. It's really an honor uh, to be here at uh, the Center for Strategic International Studies, founded by David Absher and Admiral Arlie Burke, at the height of the Cold War. And with the simple but urgent goal of finding ways for the United States to survive as a nation and prosper as a people. It's interesting that this month commemorates the 20th anniversary of the passing of Admiral Burke, who, as some of you may know, was the longest serving chief of naval operations. Admiral Burke was a strong advocate of nuclear propulsion it became standard for all U.S. submarines under his watch, a standard for which I am grateful to this day. Admiral Burke was also responsible for enhancing the nation's strategic nuclear capability when in 1960, also under his watch, the submarine U.S. as George Washington fired the first Polaris missile. That event, but more so the capability it represented would become a symbol for Americans, America's nuclear deterrent. So I think it's highly appropriate that today we're not only having a discussion on strategic deterrent forces as a foundation for 21st century national security, but that we are having that discussion right here at CSIS. To our other speakers today, uh, Dr. Keith Payne, the Honorable Frank Miller and Mr. Tom Karras-Garacco, uh, 
my sincere gratitude for you for shaping what I'm sure will be a lively dialogue today. Tom, my uh, special thanks to you also for moderating today's events. Uh, I know you will ensure we make the most of the time we have together. And to this uh, large audience, I salute your continued focus on our global security challenges for the events you host, including this one, and for the outstanding uh, publications you put out, such as Project Atom, that ensure we can keep this important dialogue going on well beyond today's sessions. Thanks also to the audience members who contribute to this dialogue. It's a static, I'm ecstatic to see this uh, crowd, but also recognize uh, individuals like General Retired uh, Norty Schwartz. Uh, sir, great to see you again here as well. Uh, uh, and for the amount of mentorship you have provided me over the years. Now, I could keep going on and on with other familiar faces. I won't uh, because uh, that would uh, make this a longer session than it's intended to be. And with the winter storm, uh, I'm told is Jonas approaching, I don't want to be between you and your exit strategy regarding the associated snowstorm. I have to admit that my travel team was a bit concerned about my strategic calculus uh, being at this forum, particularly with, with those earlier predictions of what time the uh, chaos was going to start. Uh, the last time I witnessed their concern associated with this was last January, and uh, I had insisted that uh, while we were traveling to France and, and the United Kingdom that we do a stop at Thule, Greenland in January, where we have one of our early warning radar sites. And uh, they were very concerned of being stuck there and tried to talk me out of it. I insisted we went well at work then, and I'm convinced we're all here now and it's working. So let me get started. Uh, I thought I would share a few of my thoughts with you this morning on the strategic environment and how United States Strategic Command fits into that picture and three areas associated with readiness. The sustainment and modernization requirements needed for a safe, secure, and effective and ready deterrent capability, the budget, and our most vital weapons system, our people. So let's start with the strategic environment. Today, as you know, the global security environment is more complex, dynamic, and volatile, perhaps more so than at any time in our history. The dangers posed by this unpredictable security environment are compounded by the continual propagation of asymmetric capabilities and methods, the unprecedented proliferation of advanced capabilities and technologies and the increasing provocative and destabilizing behavior on the part of both current and potential adversaries. Just a glance at the headlines today will point to efforts supporting our coalitions in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan as we continue to address the campaign against terrorists, including ISIL and other violent extremists in other places about the globe. At the same time, we have nation states such as Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, whose behavior on the international stage warrants our attention. Today's malicious cyber and counter space activities are increasingly in, are increasing in number and, of course, sophistication. Although we continue to work towards New START treaty limits, a number of nation states are developing, sustaining, or modernizing their nuclear forces and their supporting capabilities. With respect to Russia, I'm sure most of you have seen in the news Russia's new security strategy, and you see how Russia is using it uh, as the country works to emerge as, or reemerge as a great power. I know uh, Dr. Keith Payne and uh, Dr. Frank Miller will talk a little more about the Russian strategy here today, but clearly this thinking underpins the drive behind 
Moscow's continued efforts in modernizing both conventional and strategic military programs, emphasizing new strategic approaches, declaring and at times demonstrating their ability to escalate if required, and conducting destabilizing actions associated with Syria, Ukraine, and Crimea, while also violating the, international, the uh, INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, and other international accords and norms. Russia has also publicly stated that they are developing counter space capabilities, and we've seen enough news of their malicious activities in cyberspace. As, doc, as Director Clapper has testified, Russia is, quote, establishing its own cyber command, which will be responsible for conducting offensive cyber activities, including propaganda operations and inserting malware into enemy command and control systems, end quote. So even with all this, and despite assertions by some that the United States and Russia are in a nuclear arms race, there is continued progress in the new START business. By complying to a series of treaties, the United States has reduced its stockpile by 85% relative to its Cold War peak. Instead of dozens of delivery systems, we're well on our way to only four. We are retaining and modernizing only those systems needed to sustain a stable and effective deterrent capability. Given continued funding and authority, we're on track to achieve new start limits of 1550 deployed warheads and 700 deployed delivery systems by February of 2018. That is not what I would define as an arms race. To date, in meeting treaty obligations, our U.S. Air Force has eliminated all non-operational intercontinental ballistic missile silos and is in the process of placing 50 intercontinental ballistic missiles into non-deployed status. All intercontinental ballistic missiles are now demerved and deploy a single warhead. The Air Force has also eliminated all non-operational B-52 Gulf Series heavy bombers and is converting 42 B-52 hotels to conventional only bomber missions. And the United States Navy is converting four launch tubes on each of its Ohio class SSBNs, removing 56 launch tubes from accountability under New START. The benefit of the New START is that it engenders stability by maintaining rough equivalency in size and capability and, more importantly, transparency via inspections. Furthermore, it helps assure our non-nuclear allies they do not require their own nuclear deterrent capabilities. However, in order to maintain strategic stability as we draw down our nuclear deterrent forces, let there be no doubt there that the remaining systems must be safe, secure, effective, and ready. So what about China? It's not just the buildup of features into larger land masses in the South China Sea. It's also the buildup of their overarching military capabilities to support their anti-access area denial campaign and quest for sovereignty in the East and South China Seas. China continues to make significant military investments in their nuclear and conventional capabilities, with their stated goal being that of defending Chinese sovereignty. For example, China is re-engineering its long-range ballistic missiles to carry multiple nuclear warheads. They recently conducted its six successful tests of a hyperglide vehicle, and as we saw in September last year, is parading missiles clearly displaying their modernization and their capability advancements. China's pursuit of conventional prompt global strike capabilities, offensive counter space technologies, and exploitation of computer networks raises questions about China's global aspirations. 
while China periodically reminds us of its no first use nuclear policy, these developments coupled with the Chinese's intentional lack of transparency on nuclear issues such as force disposition and size can impact regional and strategic stability. Moving on to North Korea, you know, it's an understatement to say North Korea's behavior over the past 60 years has been anything but problematic. Under Kim Jong-un, North Korea continues to heighten tensions by coupling provocative statements and actions with advancements in strategic capabilities, with claims of militarized warheads, and more recently claims of a successful hydrogen bomb test and developments in road mobile and submarine launch ballistic missile technologies. These actions not only show a distinct disrespect for United Nations Security Council mandates, they show a lack of regard for regional stability. And finally, Iran. Even with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we must remain vigilant of any shift of Iranian actions regarding nuclear weapon ambitions and their ballistic missile programs, as well as their continued involvement in conflicts in the Middle East. So I think you would agree with me, clearly there's a lot going on here. While I won't go through the many other security concerns, the reality is that the strategic environment continues to increase in complexity. Unlike the bipolar world of the Cold War, today's multipolar world includes nation states and non-state actors that are more akin to multi-player, multi concurrent, potentially intersecting games of chess, challenging regional and global security dynamics. Hence, I agree with uh, Chairman uh, Joe Dunford who has said recently that we must view these threats in the context of trans-regional, multi-domain, and multi-functional. In other words, we can't look at future conflicts as being contained within the borders or stovepipe domains of specific areas of responsibility. This requires a comprehensive approach to strategic deterrence, assurance, and escalation control in the 21st century. Now as a functional combatant command, U.S. Strategic Command has trans-regional responsibility that extends from under the sea all the way up to geosynchronous orbit. While my nine Unified Command Plan assigned missions may seem distinct and disconnected, when considered as a whole, they are complementary and synergetic. They include strategic deterrence, space operations, cyber operations, global strike, joint electronic warfare, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, countering weapons of mass destruction, and analysis and targeting. This synergism allows us to support our nation's security throughout the spectrum of conflict. Now to those nine mission areas, I have six overarching priorities. At the top is to deter strategic attack against the United States and to provide assurance to our allies. Also included is providing a safe, secure, and effective and ready nuclear deterrent force. We are a warfighting command, and as such, my third priority focuses on delivering comprehensive warfighting solutions. My fourth priority is addressing challenges in space and cyberspace with capability capacity, and resilience. Despite having those nine mission areas, we can't deter and assure on our own. So my fifth priority is building, sustaining, and supporting partnerships. We work together to synchronize as a military component of our whole of government approach with other combatant commands across the interagency, with our allies and our partners, as well as with industry and academia. My sixth and final priority is to anticipate change and confront uncertainty with agility and innovation. These priorities are not stovepipe, but linked to contribute to delivering comprehensive approaches. I hope you would agree with me that achieving comprehensive deterrence and assurance requires more than just nuclear weapon systems. It rests on a whole of government approach 
and it includes having a robust intelligence apparatus, space, cyber, conventional and missile defense capabilities, global command and control and communications, and comprehensive plans that link organizations and knit their capabilities together in a coherent manner. Foundational to this effort is America's nuclear deterrent, a synthesis of dedicated sensors, assured command and control, a triad of delivery systems, nuclear weapons, enabling infrastructure, trained and ready people, and treaties and nonproliferation activities. All remain essential to our national security and continue to provide a stabilizing force in the global geopolitical fabric of the world. Now this also includes tankers to refuel our strategic bombers. I sometimes feel they, they get a bum deal that they aren't mentioned a lot because we call it a triad, but they are essential. I also reemphasize that we must have national and nuclear command and control and communications that allow us to move sensed information and to communicate seamlessly from the president down to the warfighter. We must have an industrial base and infrastructure to support the nuclear deterrent enterprise. The other piece I want to mention before I get into readiness is that deterrence is about conducting integrated and combined operations and activities and requires a comprehensive understanding and perception of the strategic environment from which an adversary, from an adversary's point of view. It requires foundational intelligence to have a deep understanding of the adversary much more than the order of battle analysis and approaches. It's about communicating capability and intent. Whether we are deterring aggression in space, cyberspace, or nuclear, and no matter the foe, our actions and capabilities must convince any adversary they cannot escalate their way out of a failed conflict and that restraint is always a better option. Our adversaries must appreciate that we are not limited to a single domain or axis. So how do we ensure that we will continue to deter our adversaries in a world where deterrence depends on the situation and one size never fits all? In a world where, to use a quote by the French strategist Raymond Aron, and sent to me by my good friend, a former National Defense University instructor and now a professional staffer on the Hill, Dr. Robert Sufer. He says, quote, there is no deterrent in general or abstract sense. It is the case of knowing who can deter whom, from what, and what circumstances, and by what means, end quote. It's about having ready forces that are properly manned, trained, and equipped, and perceived as ready. Now, having commanded U.S. Strategic Command now for a little over two years, I'm happy to say we've made tremendous progress throughout the nuclear deterrent enterprise, from oversight to investment to personnel and training. Make no mistake, U.S. Strategic Command <coughs> is a ready force capable of delivering comprehensive warfighting solutions for our Commander-in-Chief. This is thanks in part to the leaders of the White House, the Congress, as well as to the many push-ups done by both the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. Through such forums such as the Nuclear Weapons Council, the Nuclear Deterrent Enterprise Review Group, and various stakeholder meetings, We've made great strides in areas such as force improvement, readiness tracking, and resource commitments. However, most of our delivery systems and the nuclear command and control and communications architecture will be extended decades beyond their original expected service life and must be replaced in that 2025 to 2030 timeframe. Our intercontinental ballistic missiles, our B-52 bombers, and Ohio-class submarines were designed and fielded in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. By comparison, and you might be surprised that as a four-star, my wife and I drive a vehicle that's 13 years mature. Old 
by automobile standards. But it would be in what we would call a spring chicken category by our nuclear deterrent delivery system standards. She's that still reliable. My car is, that is. <laughs> but <laughs> and particularly when I get to this next part, that my car requires more maintenance to keep her that way. In fact, in my car's relatively short lifespan, there have already been nine recalls, seven defect investigations, and a few major repairs. Now, needless to say, like our nuclear deterrent systems, my car has an impeccable maintenance record. In fact, I drive my bride nuts, because no matter how busy we are, we never miss a scheduled service. Imagine the maintenance logs of our B-52 bombers after 60 years, the intercontinental ballistic missiles after 45 plus years, and the Ohio-class submarines after 30 years. The difference in maintaining these critical weapon systems and platforms and modern automobiles is that the automobile industry in general is not structured to maintain our vehicles for as long as we have maintained our nuclear triad and its associated weapons and infrastructure. Today, the extended service of our nuclear deterrent platforms is testimony to the efforts and ingenuity of our predecessors, especially the designers, the engineers, and the maintainers. Uh, one thing, though, is certain. The upkeep of our nuclear de delivery platforms increasingly challenges our airmen, our sailors, and our maintenance personnel to meet my operational availability requirements. For now, I will continue to sustain that 2003 vehicle, which has been so wonderfully reliable, although in truth, I didn't realize there was these nine recalls. Perhaps it is not as impeccably designed as I thought. But clearly, this vehicle does not have to operate under the challenging conditions in the environment that our strategic deterrent force has to. And even still, eventually, I'll have to replace that car. While that may be a vastly oversimplified comparison, there are market similarities in the way we must think about how we invest in our nuclear deterrent. Whether it's our responsiveness in dispersed Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missiles promoting stability, our ballistic missile submarines providing survivable deterrent capabilities from the depths of the ocean, or our cape dual capable B-2 and B-52 bombers demonstrating deterrence and assurance, no more noticeably than that recent B-52 flight over South Korea, signaling resolve and demonstrating the United States ironclad commitment to our allies in the Pacific. The ability to provide assured communication from the president down to the warfighter, or a stockpile in its infrastructure that is the oldest it has ever been and much like the rest of us, will only continue to age. We are fast approaching the point where we will put at risk our safe, secure, and effective and ready nuclear deterrent, potentially jeopardizing strategic stability. We must not let our deterrence capabilities be determined by failure to sustain and modernize our forces. This is critical in the global security environment where it is clear that for the foreseeable future, other nations are placing high priority on developing, sustaining, and modernizing their nuclear deterrent forces. The ground-based strategic deterrent must replace our Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile system and ensure an adversary cannot launch a comprehensive counterforce attack on the United States by striking only a few targets. The Ohio replacement program is necessary to provide maximum survivability. The long-range strike bomber must provide the flexibility, visibility, and ability to forward deploy in support of our extended deterrence commitments to our allies. Now, while each leg of the triad provides a hedge against technical problems or changes in the security environment, the triad must have effective weapons. The B-6112 is needed 
to continue enhancing the credibility of our security commitments to our allies and will replace four of its current variants. The long-range strike option cruise missile must preserve existing military capability in the face of evolving threats. As such, we must stay on track with our three plus two warhead strategy, which defines the path forward for synchronizing required platform delivery platforms and weapons sustainment and modernization programs and provides an opportunity to reduce the weapon stockpile consistent with our non-proliferation goals. Delaying development and fielding any of these programs would unacceptably increase risks to our nation's strategic deterrent capability. Equally, if not more important, delaying would directly affect our credibility and ability to deter and assure. We are out of time. Sustainment is a must. Recapitalization is a requirement. I know you are well aware of our current resource environment. While many talk about sustaining and modernizing our nuclear enterprise in terms of costs, which is important in this fiscal environment, it is imperative that we expand that conversation to seriously consider the value derived from investment over the long term. Our budget has a deterrent value of its own and reflects our nation's commitment to our deterrent strategy. If we are to meet future challenges, we must have a synchronized campaign of investments supporting the full range of military operations that secure our national security objectives across the globe. Our choice is not between keeping the current forces or replacing them. Rather, the choice is between replacing those forces or risk not having them at all. As a nation, we need continued investment in our nuclear deterrent forces foundational intelligence, nuclear command and control and communications, space, cyberspace, missile defense, and personal development programs. Without timely investment, we risk degrading the deterring and stabilizing effect of a strong and credible nuclear deterrent force. Similar to how the U.S. analyzes the budgets of other countries, our adversaries pay close attention to how we back up our words with resources. To that end, budget stability is integral to strategic stability. Now this brings me to my final area, people. In much the same way as we sustain and modernize our platforms and our weapons, we must also sustain and modernize our workforce. We must invest in the future of the professionals, both civilian and military, who operate, maintain, secure, engineer, and support our nuclear enterprise. We need individuals who are willing to develop and stretch their intellect beyond, well beyond, one-dimensional problems. We need chess players who can operate in a multi-dimensional environment with multiple activities taking place simultaneously on a board where they may not fully understand the rules by which our adversaries are playing. Capturing attention outside our community, however, requires innovation. Some of you have heard our Secretary of Defense uh, talk about building a force of the future that will allow our personnel to gain skills and experiences that they can bring back into the military. When part is getting them into programs. But the second part is how do we, for example, pique the interests of people like Lieutenant Colonel Demetrius Walters, a fellow here at the, uh, this uh, center, or Lieutenant Commander Eric Little, a fellow at the Mitchell Institute, such that they request a follow-on assignment to U.S. Strategic Command. Over to you, Dimitri. <coughs> And how about our pony, that project on nuclear issues that you just heard uh, Dr. Henry talk about, those scholars. It's great to see Matt Kozlow working so closely with Dr. Payne, but are we doing enough to keep those scholars interested in the long term? As a command, U.S. Strategic Command is also working in this area. For example, we've established the Academic Alliance Program 
focus on developing a community of interest for deterrence and assurance in the context of national security. We are now partnered with some 20 universities and military higher education institutes to include places like Stanford, Georgetown National Defense University, as well as several of our own local Nebraska universities. You'd be surprised at the intellectual base that I have there in the local community, University of Nebraska, Lincoln University of Nebraska, Omaha, and Creighton, just to name a few. Tomorrow, we will kick off the third of our 13-week fellowship programs at the University of Nebraska Omaha, aimed specifically at providing professional growth opportunities for my civilian workforce. In March, the University of Nebraska Omaha will also host the inaugural Deterrence and Assurance Workshop, aimed at bringing some of these professionals together to talk deterrence and assurance topics. They've also managed to secure an alumni, you may recall, the former Secretary uh, Chuck Hagel to speak there. Recognizing that we must have a deeper understanding of adversary intent and perceptions, we're engaging with the interagency and academic partners in sponsoring a series of what I call deep dive intellectual sessions to understand this better. There are many more that I could mention, but the bottom line is this. As a whole, are we doing enough to stimulate interest in this nuclear enterprise, deterrence theories, escalation control theories? Does that interest range from high in academics to education, to edu educating and informing the men and women who operate, secure and maintain and weapon systems and platforms, and to those who are key to our deliberate and crisis action planning? Are we collectively engaging our replacements in purposeful discussions at all levels of their professional development? Are we preparing them to think through complex scenarios, in some cases unthinkable scenarios, and encouraging them to develop integrated plans during peacetime so that they can continue executing deterrence and thoughtful arms control agreements? How do we accelerate this understanding and approaches to the multi-domain strategic problems that involve nuclear, counter space, and cyber adversary operations involving multiple actors? In other words, are we inspiring the next Tom Schelling or Henry Kissinger to address 21st century deterrence, assurance, and escalation control issues? Now there is no doubt for 70-some years, thanks in part to our credible nuclear forces, that the United States has deterred great power war against nuclear-capable adversaries. It's impressive to see today's systems working well beyond their expected service life, but of course, we can't rely on that forever. We must modernize the force, including the people, to ensure this force remains capable of delivering strategic stability and foundational deterrence well into the future, even as we pursue third offset strategic choices. There are many who voice concern regarding affordability of the recapitalization programs, but I would argue in this era of explicit and emergent security threats to our nation and its allies, how can we afford not to? The readiness of our weapon systems and our budget and our workforce is critical to providing this nation a safe, secure, and effective and ready strategic deterrent to provide the President of the United States options should deterrence fail. Our nuclear deterrent remains a vital and central element of the United States and allied national security. It supports the President's nonproliferation goals and our sustainment and modernization plans is in line with the 2015 National Military Strategy, the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review, the 2013 Report on Nuclear Employment Strategy, and the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review. As Secretary of Defense Carter reaffirmed before Congress back in December, nuclear deterrence is, quote, the bedrock of our security, and therefore having an effective, modern, safe, secure nuclear deterrent is absolutely critical, end quote. 
Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Um, it's okay with you. We'll have a few, uh, a few questions and then open up the floor. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Tom Carrico. I'm a senior fellow in the International Security Program here at CSIS. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out, braving the cold. Uh, it's also a very good sign. It's reassuring that STRATCOM is projecting power under these adverse conditions. Rogue states should take note uh, that this is a symbol of resolve. So thank you for coming. Um, let me start off with addressing really what the first of the four countries that you spoke about and identified as a, as a sort of a major threat issue, um, and that's Russia. And I wonder if you might talk a little bit about their um, apparent first use policy. Uh, you mentioned uh, the escalate to de-escalate question, um, and how that and their across the board uh, modernization efforts for their nuclear arsenal would seem to indicate their interest in uh, future arms control. Well, first and foremost, I would say uh, that uh, uh, Russia clearly has been working on it, emerging as a, a great power. And as such, uh, part of that in their mind has been uh, modernizing their uh, strategic nuclear forces and, and, in fact, exercising them. Uh, many places over the globe, we've seen a lot of their long-range strategic uh, aircraft flights and then uh, some of their... Uh, uh, major exercises, exercising all their uh, components of it, uh, and being very vocal about how far they've gone in modernizing that capability. Uh, what's disturbing, and I would say destabilizing, is uh, associated with that the discussions they're having openly over their uh, their uh, plan to escalate in order to de-escalate, as you just described. Uh, when you look at, uh, and as I've tried to emphasize here, uh, my role as strategic commander is to deter strategic attack. And as such, uh, working hard to maintain strategic stability, uh, that piece and that approach, and not just, as I say, you can have capability, but it's how you uh, de deploy it, operate it, and how you talk about it that uh, can be uh, disturbing, in, in my opinion. Uh, I was in the UK uh, uh, during a time frame where you may have seen the articles associated with uh, some of their long-range strategic aircraft uh, flying without transporters, ponders on, you know, which, uh, quite frankly, uh, in my opinion, is reckless uh, in terms of our international standards today. So that's just one example. But Well, you, you quoted several... Um senior uh, defense officials talking about the importance of uh, nuclear, the nuclear mission. Secretary Hagel, uh, before he departed, said that uh, the nuclear mission is the, the department's highest priority. Um, in light of that, um, but also uh, juxtaposed with the fact that we talk a lot about the, the combination of conventional and nuclear forces for deterrence, how do you see the specific uh, utility and the specific uniqueness of nuclear forces for deterrence? Well, uh, first of all, I would say I'm pretty proud of um, how uh, I've seen during my tour of command here uh, as we looked at problems square in the face uh, and took uh, very deliberate actions to improve the readiness of our capability. And we didn't just have a top-down approach. We had a bottom-up approach called these force improvement programs that still uh, uh, in operation, our uh, sailors, soldiers, airmen, and marines that are involved in this mission space and the civilians are continually assessing and working uh, to improve uh, and, and be consistent with that piece. It's also, you know, when we look at the various uh, offset strategies, when we look at that second one in particular, uh, of where and how far we as a nation have gone in terms of precision-guided uh, strike, uh, long-range strike and those kind of things, the uh, integrated nature by which we fight as a joint military force. Uh, and, and that piece matters. Uh, we want to keep, we want to keep from having a conflict first off, but if we are, we want to keep it uh, in a conventional nature 
but as we look at the spectrum of conflict, it's very important uh, as we look at any adversary, potential adversary having uh, nuclear capability, that that's in consideration across that spectrum. Uh, as we look at working that uh, in a big way, uh, such that, uh, again, no adversary would think uh, that they would benefit from escalating their way out of a failed conflict and that it would be costly to them and restraint is a much better option. Very good. Yeah, you highlighted uh, a number of modernization programs. One of them was uh, the LRSO. Uh, you, you, you said, I think I got the quote, uh, you, that we must preserve the existing military capability in the face of evolving, increasing uh, threats. Uh, Frank Kendall, uh, among other uh, senior DOD officials, uh, has emphasized the importance. Uh, Secretary Kendall mentioned that uh, without LRSO, the air-breathing leg of the triad would be a symbol of American decline rather than a bellwether of our strength. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the importance of that as a replacement for the current uh, outcome uh, and whether you see it as uh, the LRSO is destabilizing. Well, I do not see the LRSO as stabilizing, quite the contrary, period, dot end. Uh, it's a capability we as a country need to have uh, and you know that replacement for our uh, cruise missile is really, quite frankly, a life extension program, if you will. Uh, in terms of using the guts uh, of the old to uh, be able to allow it to function and also have this, the right security apparatus. But like I have mentioned here, uh, this whole art of deterrence is also about perceptions. And uh, you can't just be in a one-trick pony kind of thing. So each of our uh, legs are important in that deterrence calculus. And as a result, uh, not only do you need to have a a uh, replacement for the air launch cruise missile, uh, particularly as you look at how long we will continue to use our B-52 platforms, and you look at the advancement of adversary capability and anti-access aerial denial, uh, there's no option there. So I find that not having that would be destabilizing, I would argue. So uh, this piece of uh, some of the rhetoric you sense relative to that kind of discussion, uh, I think is uh, more harmful to where we need to uh, be, remain focused as a country. Well, one more, uh, you mentioned missile defense in your remarks. Uh, the 2010 BMDR highlighted missile defense as contributing to regional deterrence. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see regional and homeland missile defense efforts that, we're, that the United States is doing uh, as complementing assurance and deterrence of the missions that you have? Well, I would say, uh, you know, as I always try to mention, and I did here in my discussion earlier, of how uh, missile def our missile defense efforts are, are also part of our uh, strategic deterrent kit bag, if you will. Um, and it's very important. When we just look at what happened here on the 5th of January, Kim Jong-un uh, testing a uh, a nuclear weapon. Now, the success of that is still under question or not, but we know it was a test. And this is, uh, we know the uh, appetite of uh, that country and that leadership in moving in that direction. So uh, I think it's important for us to be able to have that kind of capability in order to address uh, where we know uh, uh, North Korea wants to go. Very good. Well, why don't we open it up for a couple questions? I know you have to depart at 11, but uh, we've got time for a couple. And we've got uh, microphones. Please identify yourself. And uh... Uh, Zach Biggs with Jane's Defense Weekly. Um, you described some of the budgetary constraints that are going to impact the recapitalization plans. Um, given that in the current projections, unless a new line is developed to pay for that recapitalization, the money won't be there. Do you think it would be possible to complete the responsibilities in your command if, for instance, as at least one former Secretary of Defense advised, we cut to two different legs for the triad? Is it possible to complete your mission if one of the legs was eliminated? Well, Zach, uh, Zach, right? If I remember. Um, you know, uh, it was interesting watching the formation of the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review. And in all the homework and analysis that went on, uh, excruciatingly detailed. Um, it was in Pentagon also during part of that 
And uh, it was really refreshed, the, the amount of critical analysis that was done looking at other methodologies. But at the end of the day, uh, it concluded, and, and as I mentioned all those other strategic documents uh, since then, that the uh, triad was valuable to our country as a nation. It's not just U.S. strategic command. It's about the survivability of our nation. Any adversary that looks at, and as I talked about some of the modernization programs that are underway, uh, you can't just wish that away. And as a result, uh, it has to be addressed. So the real key here is, uh, in my opinion, this is a must pay for our country's own insurance as long as we have these nuclear weapons that are in other nations. And uh, as we look at order of battle and thinking, it takes a while for countries to invest, for example, like Russia has and China is doing. Uh, even North Korea, as we look at KN08s and Musadons and those kind of things. Uh, and that gets you in an order of battle piece. But the intent can flip. Uh, misperceptions and what have you in that regard. And as I say, I think as a nation, we want to make sure any adversary that, as I stated before, that thinks they can escalate their way out of a failed conflict has to think again. If they won't get the benefits, if so, seek in that methodology. It's going to be extremely costly, and restraint is a much better option. We have a question right here in the front, the Undersecretary. Admiral, I'm Bob Einhorn at the Brookings Institution. Uh, you um, suggested that it's important for us to convince uh, Russia's leaders now and in the future that it would be a huge mistake uh, to initiate the use of nuclear weapons in the midst of a conventional conflict, say, around Russia's periphery. Uh, with the uh, forward deployed dual capable aircraft and the B-6112, will we have sufficient capability uh, to persuade Russia's leaders that it would be a huge mistake, or do we need more? And if so, what, what else do we need? Well, sir, I think we're on the right path relative to the investments we have uh, and we're continuing to make uh, relative to uh, one, as we discussed earlier, uh, B-6112, when you look at the age of the various variants that it's replacing, uh, it provides the future uh, dual capable aircraft kind of capability. Uh, the, that piece and the extended deterrence piece, I think, uh, are critical going forward. So our current investment plan, you know, as I say, necking down the three plus two warheads, having our, in addition, our long range strike bomber capability. Uh, these capabilities are complementary. They're not duplicative. And as a result, uh, I think we're on the right path with a very balanced approach that's consistent uh, from the strategies that we have laid out over time, at least the ones that I have seen, uh, particularly from two star days uh, up to uh, now. Uh, that, that's a good balance, but we need to stay on course, and that's where my head is that we need to stay on course. We're back our first time. Thank you. Admiral, thank you for your remarks. I'm Rebecca Hurstman. I'm the director of the project on nuclear issues here at CSIS. I wanted to ask you to drill a little bit deeper. Um, when you think about the dream team that you need in the next generation, could you tell us a little bit more about what are some of those attributes and skills that you want to make sure we're encouraging and cultivating across that human capital strategy? Uh, I think that, you know, really thinking ahead, what does that look like? Who do you need? What do you need? Uh, Rebecca, great seeing you again, and thanks for that uh, question. Uh, when I look at the dream team, uh, as you have called it, I first of all look at uh, ensuring we have um, uh, folks that understand history, that understand the spectrum of conflict, but also are uh, very versatile 
Uh, the real piece, I think, for our future as we look at multi-domain, multi-functional uh, adversaries and what have you is I feel that the younger generations have to be more agile and adept than we have been, and they need to contribute now and into the future. And what do I mean by that? Uh, sometimes it's coined as uh, high velocity learning, you know, to be able to be uh, almost from a learning standpoint, and quite frankly, I consider myself still a student uh, as uh, I work to study things and what have you challenged my team. Uh, but you practically need to be in almost a beta status, if that's a word, uh, in terms of the ability to absorb things but connect the dots. Uh, in a broader way, uh, but in particular, just understanding how hard the nut to crack in terms of being able to understand perceptions as we work strategies is very important. And that's easy to say, but hard to do. And being able to have those ability to debate, arm wrestle your way to strategies, and then plans, and then not have the plans in some form of a static thing, those plans have to be nimble. And you have to be able to quickly uh, adapt them to uh, the problems that we see today in a different way. Uh, you know, when you look at uh, just North Korea, not just a nuclear test, but wasn't that long ago we were talking about sunny production enterprises and cyber. Uh, that business of, you, you know, you can't just look at North Korea through a nuclear lens. You got to look at it through the multi-dimensional piece. So we need people that can bring those kind of thoughts to the table uh, and really look at it in this multi-domain, multi-complex problem. Uh, I'm an engineering from schooling of, uh, of, of sorts. And it's interesting as you look at vessel functions and all that, and we break down things in equations that had the dot, 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 dot part. Uh, so you have that main piece here, but those dot, dot, dots still matter in how we're able to fuse that together in a sensible way with the ultimate goal of making sure our national uh, leadership has more decision space. We owe that to them as we go forward. <coughs> Well, thank you, Admiral. I appreciate your time. I know you've got to run off to another meeting. Before we break, or pause, rather, I want to thank especially the National, National Institute for Public Policy and Keith Payne in particular for helping to organize and put this thing on. Thank you, Keith. Uh, can can, oh, can I say one last thing before oh, you shoo me off? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one, again, I, I can't thank you enough for not just being here, but for what you, many of you are doing in your day-to-day -day business, uh, whether you're scrutinizing our approaches or whether you're on the team building. Uh, but I would be remiss also if I didn't salute all those sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and civilians, and I noticed my emphasis too on civilians, that help work this really complex problem day in and day out in terms of things that's so critical to our foundation of nation, national security. So thanks for having this forum, thanks for inviting me, but also I want to publicly thank them. Thank you very much.